So first off, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Julie Whitbeck. Julie is a terrestrial ecologist with a lifelong interest in informing human management of Earth's resources with sound scientific understanding. After several years in academia in 2011, she began working as an ecologist for the John Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve, which is part of the National Park Service system. Her research and her stewardship practice address whole plant to ecosystem scale responses to environmental variation, focusing on responses to climate change and ecosystem restoration. For many years, we investigated sea level rise impacts on coastal forested wetlands, and she has explored factors underlying effective cypress swamp restoration. In her work as a place-based steward, she strives to apply scientific understanding to address resource management challenges. As part of this work and around its edges, she continues to teach, learn, and practice ecology in formal and informal contexts. So let's welcome Julie. <laughs> Brought my own peanut gallery. <laughs> um, good to be here and be part of this meeting. I have a. I want to start actually with a question for the audience. Uh, so I want to. I'll engage the online audience too. This question is for you as well. I'm getting the sense of being here in the room that most of the audience is from the academic sector. And, but I'm not sure that I'm right, so I want to really understand who my audience is, who we all are here today, but for people here in the room, and if you want to self-identify, I'm with academia, I'll, I'll say a few different sectors, I might not say your sector, but for you to offer your sector. And then for those of you who are online, uh, one, of, one of the moderators is going to be trans transferring your responses to the group here, so we can understand who's with us online and, and where you're coming from. So if you're from academia, you raise your hand. Okay, so we've got a lot of hands raised. I would just estimate more than 50% of the group here. Uh, what about from government? Any kind of government? In that gallery, okay. Um, what about from private place-based managers, private sector place-based managers, NGO place-based managers? Great, okay. What about community land managers, place-based managers, or cultural resource managers? What sectors? Didn't I mention that anybody might want to volunteer that, that they represent here today? Okay, we're not seeing any hands on that here in the room. I am interested to know who's with us online. Yeah, so we have, you know, we have, Two tribal government folks, two government uh, government research folks, another tribal government, uh, university government partnership, local NGO, and independent researcher. Cool. So a lot of academic practitioners, scientists, knowledge knowledge uh, gainers, and then a sprinkling of place-based managers, cultural resource managers mixes of all of that. I think what I want to talk with you about today and what I welcome your questions on is what it's like to be a place-based manager. I'm going to speak from a real specific uh, institutional operating system and, um, and also, you know, from my experience, my prior experience uh, in academia, I'm a translator of science in the practice of managing natural resources in the context of a U.S. federal government place, place uh, public land system. Let's see if I can get going here. There we go. My title is Learning from the Landscape, Guiding 21st Century Stewardship at the Barrett Area Preserve. The Barrett Area Preserve is one unit of John Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve. This is a U.S. national park that strives to uh, sustain and interpret for present and future generations the cultural, historical, and natural resources of South and South Central Louisiana, Southeastern and South Central Louisiana. 
Park was established in 1978 by an act of Congress, which is typically how the U.S. National Park Service units are established by acts of Congress that are uh, simulated by human beings who live there to preserve. <clears throat> I'll tell you more about the place as we go forward. Uh, the reason I have this, is, and I said the places are established by human beings. This is an image of some of the a couple of the movers and shakers who represent the. Sorry, yeah, the point is not working for me very well. Who represent the environmentalist and cultural stewards uh, who garnered their friends and their families and their communities. In their effort to lobby for the establishment of this particular park. And we're all gathered here on the left hand photo on the side of the screen in honor of the old tree, which is kind of an interesting gathering. So we're there with a couple of scientists, with the park superintendent, um, these elders who, who worked so hard to get this particular park to become a U.S. part of the U.S. national park system and tap into the resources that the federal government can provide for that. Uh, we've also got some more contemporary environmentalists there too. Our, one, another one of our park superintendents just reminds us that it is really people and people that motivate these public places and, and our public land system is for all of us, for all of the people. In all of my work for the park, um, I think it's important for all of us here in the room, all of us here in the session to understand that our management is guided by policy. And this is for, for people who manage federal lands, this is federal policy that guides how we manage these places. So this, these are policies like the National Environmental Protection Act, all the cultural, uh, cultural and historical protection acts. We work with tribes, we work with state historic preservation offices, we work with the EPA, we work with, you know, dot, 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 all the state agencies that help us uh, keep, help us uh, keep healthy as much as we can, all of these different kinds of resources, and that we are operating within the bounds of the law as written and as interpreted. Writ large in the National Park System, our policy directs us to restore natural systems to reestablish natural functions and processes where they are damaged or impaired, and to remove exotic species. So I want to take a minute to dive into where this place is that I'm that I manage. We're in the delta of the Mississippi River. It's one of our planet's massive river systems, unlike pretty much anywhere else in North America, but we have similar kinds of systems worldwide. So we can look at the Yangtze River, we can look at the Nile River Delta, we can look at the Mekong River Delta. We can look at deltas all over the world and see and understand, uh, we see similarities with how those deltaic coastal wetlands work and those systems work. Um, and, and also we see differences between how our place here in the Mississippi River works and how other coastal wetlands and coastal places in the U.S. work. So let's see, the Mississippi River has a massive drainage basin. Everything that happens in that basin has the possibility to have an influence here in the deltaic wetlands of the Mississippi River system. So today we're hearing about climate patterns all across North America and globally. And all of that, all of the climate impacts on the whole drainage basin of the Mississippi River are translated and transferred here to the delta of the Mississippi River where we experience the flashiness of precipitation, say on the front range of the Rocky Mountains, or a drought in the um, central central twin states. Today, the river is at a historical low. I don't know if any of you flew here, but um, flying north south along the Mississippi River these days is um, it's impressive. You see all the sandbars in the river, so all these bright light yellow light colored sandbars on the river is super low. And yet in 2011, uh, the Corps of Engineers was opening spillways and floodways that they hadn't opened in some sense ever, but um, in, in a long time, in a generation or more, uh, in order to contain the flood rivers, the flood waters of the Mississippi River. All right, so with those uh, flood waters comes sediment. So 
bright red, yellow, but bright yellow in this false color imagery is sediment that's carried by the Mississippi River during its flood. In a natural river system, those sediments build the delta. So the river brings water, fresh water, it brings everything that's dissolved in that, in that fresh water. It brings big hunks of material like trees. It also brings very fine sediments and bigger sediments, bigger chunks. So by the time we get all the way down the river course here to the delta, we're seeing the fine sediments and those spread out into the water and they change the, um, the reflectance of the water sur surface. And we can see that using our, uh, our satellite based sensors that reflect this and get these beautiful images that show up where that sediment is where the rivers and flood. But where you'll see it is, is where we've directed the river to go over the past uh, several decades. So you don't see much of that sediment actually in the coastal deltaic wetlands of the Mississippi River. This is a look at just the past 5,000 years of the Mississippi River Delta. I'm going to sort of zoom through this, so apologies. Each of these different colored blobs is one of the a different delta lobe of the Mississippi River developed at a time when the river's course was flowing predominantly in that area. So about 5,000 years ago, the river was building the Salé Seafermore Delta, flowing down part of what we think of as the Atchafalaya River uh, basin today. When a river is in flood, it's carrying all those, uh, the velocity of the river is really strong, it's carrying all the sediments that it is, of course. Uh, as the river bends, well, the outer edges of the river, the velocity slows down. Forces of gravity exceed then the velocity and the force of the, the river. The sediment falls out. That falling out of sediment onto the shallow terrestrial landscape is what builds up the land and forms a, a, a river delta lobe. That's a geology and a snapshot from an ecologist. Um, over time, that you've built up an awful, the river has built up an awful lot of land there and the energy gradient for the flow of the river has shifted. So the river changes course, this is why massively the river changes course and takes a new direction and starts building up its deltaic land in a different place. Um, so the, over the past 5,000 years, uh, in the Blake Benign in geological time, the river has built up a lot of land here in southeastern Louisiana. I'm zooming in on the Veritary Preserve, which is the uh, roughly this area on the eastern side of Lake Salvador and Lake Katawashi, north the northern part of the Veritary Basin. The light, the orange colors are the high ground, and the greens and blues are the low ground in water. What we see, oh, actually, I'm going to just back this. What we see here is the an old tributary course of the Mississippi River. This is part of the St. Bernard Delta formation about 2,500 to 1,500 years ago. When, so about a third of the river's flow was coming through what is now conserved in Jean Lafitte Park and Veritaria Reserve. The high ground is the natural levee ridges of those old river courses, both what we call today Valle de Pardine, main north to south course, and then Valle Veritaria, which comes there. Okay. But we've changed the course of the river. We've changed how the river works an awful lot. We've got upstream bent dams and levees. Got hurricane protection levee system now. We've carved up the coast with, with uh, for commerce um, and for access to fisheries, with canals. So we've really changed the landscape and how the water moves, therefore how the sediment moves. Therefore, how we how we sustain the, the surface elevations and all the resources and salt mineral resources that come into these wetlands, and also the flow of the resources from those terrestrial wetlands back to the aquatic system. Trying to be the context in which we're managing the system. These are things that are completely out of control of a place-based manager in a federal land that's that's confined uh, to a small space. I think we've talked about you guys are um, a very sophisticated audience, so I'm actually not even going to address these slides. So apologies to the people online. I hope you've been with us. Um, we are experiencing climate change and an increase in temperature that leads to an increase in ocean heat content. And additionally, the 
increasing uh, atmospheric heat and thermal heat of our crust is melting our ice ice sheets, both terrestrial and aquatic, oceanic. And that's leading to an increase in relative sea level. One of the things I failed to talk about earlier in the um, I talked about the building of the delta lobe, but I failed to talk about the decline of delta lobe. So what happens when the river changes course and goes somewhere else? What happens in the place that it used to be? Well, at the same time as the river is delivering sediment, those sediments are losing the water, uh, which is surrounding each sediment particle. They're losing any air spaces that might be around those particles. So the volume that the uh, that the new sediment that's surrounded by all this air and water takes up is much greater than the volume of, as it loses those air and water spheres around each particle. The volume that the soil takes up diminishes. The land subsides, so it's losing volume. It's also subject to the force of gravity, and so it's compacting and sinking under its own mass. Our bedrock is not right here in Baton Rouge, but um, further south where the delta is uh, most expressed. Our, our bedrock is just hundreds of meters below us. So that compaction of these alluvial sediments is um, a big force. It's very rapid. This process is called subsidence and that leads to the decline of the delta cycle. So all of the, in at the same time as we're experiencing an increase in relative in sea level or relative sea level as measured at our one of our long term um, tide gauges in Grand Isle, Louisiana, a measurement of approximately nine millimeters per year. Half of that, or more than half of that, is driven by this very rapid rate of subsidence here in the Mississippi Delta. Nine millimeters a year. Let's just round to one centimeter a year. It's about a meter of subsidence over a hundred years, or a meter of relative sea level rise rather over a hundred years. As we look at the top, total topographic range of our the preserve that we manage, on the order of just over a meter. So we're looking at only the highest parts of that preserve being above water, being terrestrial landscape in approximately another century. So that is the place where. The southernmost extent of our bottomland hardwood forest exists today, rapidly transforming. I'm going to step back. I skipped a slide. This nine millimeter a year rate is the highest rate in North America and among the highest globally. It's an exceptional rate of relative sea level rise, and it's one of the things that one of, it's one of the elements of climate change that is so different about being here in coastal Louisiana. Than being so many other places on the planet. And yet it's so similar to many other major river deltas on our planet. All right, the other thing that we experience, of course, is hurricanes. We heard a few speakers on that this morning, so I want to address it just to say that as a place based manager, we think of hurricane impacts here in the subtropics and on the coastal subtropics as being part of the natural disturbance regime. Yet we hear that their intensities are increasing with our increasing global uh, energy. And that um, we can expect, we don't know, to expect with respect to frequency, but certainly intensity has a big impact on disturbance regime. So, as natural resource managers, we face a lot of challenges that are pretty much out of the realm of our control. We experience modified water budget and modified hydrology, elimination of the river source of water by levees, increased penetration of gulf water and forces via the canals that have excavated in our landscape. Reduction and elimination of precipitation draining from our upper uh, upper basin, upper Baratharia basin, in the context of the Baratharia Reserve, due to the hurricane protection levee system, and a really rapid rate of relative sea level rise. This is increasing ocean influence and a rapid increase in flooding depth and duration. So, as place based managers, that's what we're looking at. How can we adapt our management in order to sustain these cultural, historical, and natural resources? for our next generations? That's sort of the big picture question we struggle with as place stewards. So great policy uh, directs us to restore natural systems, reestablish natural functions and remove exotic species. At the park level, we have some enabling legislation for our park 
It includes restoring a more natural hydrology. One of the ways that were that the uh, the people who constructed the general management plan for the park. So this is sort of a level of sub policy that guides park stewardship. They said they observed very astutely that canals alter the hydrology in the park, and that it would be beneficial or anticipated to be beneficial if we were able to remove the impacts of those canals on the park. So this is an action that our place-based stewards can take. We can reduce, we can uh, restore greater connectivity between the aquatic system and the terrestrial system in our deltaic and estuarine wetlands. So there are a lot of benefits to restoring that connection. What we do is we either cut gaps in those canal banks, those soil banks, the canals are excavated, the material from the channel is piled up on the sides, we call those spoil banks. You can cut gaps in those spoil banks to restore flow between the terrestrial wetlands and the aquatic channels. You can also drag the entire spoil bank into the channel. You can try to uh, restore some sinuosity to the channel. <clears throat> Do a lot of um, engineering to manage uh, how the system works. In the end, we're reducing impoundment. It's very important to us in the context of greater influence from the Gulf of Mexico, because when we see storm surge, that massive force that's pushing the water moves the water right up over all these bumps, these little bumps that are the spoil banks. But then we're relying on gravity for that salty water to flow back out of the system. In these, these, and salt water is toxic in these freshwater wetlands. So that, that return of the salty water to the estuarine system out of those freshwater wetlands is really important. For guys park management, I wish I could say that sound science guides park management. And uh, so I wanna engage hope, uh, say that we really need to, to build bridges that enable sound science to guide management. I act as a science translator for park stewards who are making the decisions. But I inform the decisions and I can bring science to inform those decisions. A lot of times the science is not, um, science is motivated by running at the edge of discovery, discovering something new. It's very hard to publish something that somebody published three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 40 years ago. So in order to get funded, in order to um, build our understanding of our world, we, we ride the wave of discovery. A lot of that wave of discovery is not super relevant to the specific place-based management questions that place-based managers grapple with. So it's trying to find the sweet spots where contemporary science and new understanding and new discovery can inform very pragmatic within the control of a particular place-based manager steward that's, that's sort of where, where I'd like to see um, these greater interactions between scientists and place-based managers go. I think maybe I have said enough for, for right now. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yes. We have one more presenter and then we'll do our, our panel Q&A. So keep those questions, that's it. So Ethan is gonna be joining us remotely. Is he, there he is, yeah. Uh, so Ethan Shute is the Senior Water Resource Manager for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma in Durant, Oklahoma. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a bachelor's degree in geography and from the University of Texas A&M with a master's degree in geosciences. He's a licensed professional geologist in the state of Texas, enabling him to work on many unique public-private projects. Ethan's current position involves working with federal, state, and local stakeholders within the Choctaw Nation Reservation to properly implement their historic water settlement agreement. This includes working on various projects ranging from a manager managing a water quality program, drinking and wastewater infrastructure evaluation, to developing comprehensive hydrologic models and evaluating potential drought vulnerabilities in local communities. 
In addition, Ethan serves as the foundation's primary investigator for our Southside forecast, focusing on adaptation and mitigation strategies for tribal communities that are or will be adversely affected by climate change. So I'm going to hand it off to Ethan. Thank you, Emma. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. And I know I'm the last speaker uh, between you guys and lunch, so I will be brief. But uh, I am Ethan Schuth, the Senior Water Resource Manager here at the Choctaw Nation. And today I'll be discussing climate change and basin integrity. So to start off, uh, I'll give you some uh, regional information for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. So we are located in the southeastern quadrant of the state of Oklahoma. Our reservation is approximately 11,000 square miles. Um, inside of that reservation, we get an average uh, from east to west and north to south of approximately 50 inches of rainfall. We span two major Huck Six watersheds, the Red River to our south, that is approximately two thirds of our reservation and the uh, Canadian River to the north with the, the remaining third. And Choctaw Nation sits in a very unique area of Oklahoma as we have five level three eco regions that occur within our boundaries. It's also important to note that we do manage and maintain, uh, I believe, over 7,000 acres uh, between two different ranches and additional lands within the reservation as well. So in my office, uh, our focus is mainly on watershed studies. Uh, like I spoke before, we have the Red River and Canadian Rivers. So we are actually working with the South Central Climate, Climate Science Center, uh, Adaptation Science Center, excuse me. And we are focusing on water availability and vulnerability with the University of Oklahoma, the Chickasaw Nation, uh, and Barney Austin's group with Aqua Strategies as well. So we are focusing on understanding how climate change is going to impact those major watersheds and the communities that rely on that water. We also do other watershed planning initiatives. We're currently working with the BIA on some other um, watersheds inside of our jurisdictional area. And we are developing watershed plans to increase the productivity of those water bodies inside of those areas. And we're also trying to make a framework to, imp to place that in other places inside of our reservation. My staff that are on uh, here at the Choctaw Nation also focus on emergency impact planning. So what that is, is we've taken, taken the, the mystery out of everything by doing it this way, because a lot of our communities inside of Choctaw Nation, when you say the words climate change, they instantly glaze over or they just stop communicating. So to ensure that we're not just focusing on drought contingency and you know, climate change impacts, we've developed an emergency impact, impact planning aspect to increase our community's resiliency and their infrastructural resiliency to climate change impacts. And that includes droughts, floods, the abnormal freeze and, and, and heating back up during the winter here in Oklahoma. We also strive to place uh, our, our, our extract information from our historic preservation guys inside of Choctaw Nation to make sure that our, our cultural impacts are being accounted for inside of our climate models, inside of our watershed planning initiatives. And moving on, we're also adam, uh, actively involved in climate change impacts, and that is focusing mainly on reliability and sustainability. So I'm going to expand a little bit on those two terms here. So sustainability, and, and stick with me on this, guys. I know it's a very wordy slide. What is it and why does it matter? The main reason I put these definitions up here is to show everyone that there is a lot of common ground, even though it's said completely differently, from an international level to a national level to a local level to a tribal level. So... In these three um, definitions that are shown here, and I want to go to the bottom one as that is how Choctaw Nation defines sustainability. And that's the balance of preservation and utilization of natural resources for the long-term benefit of the economy, environment, and the Choctaw culture that allows for equitable, multi-generational access to those resources and their benefits. 
So when that comes to mind, when we're thinking about sustainability, a lot of the time people get polarized and they, they stop thinking and they start reacting emotionally. What, what sustainability is, is whole systems recognition. And for this, it's very simplistic, but it works. And it's a bathtub and it, it's talking about the replacement rate. And this is a great analog for a groundwater basin and how we as humans and stewards of, of the environment should be treating that resource. So in its simplest terms, when you have a bathtub and you put the, the, drug, uh, the uh, drain plug in at the bottom and you turn the water on, the basin fills. If you continue to add water at that rate, it'll eventually spill out unless you pull the drain plug out. So for that replacement rate, if you have some sort of balance or level that is conducive for all utilizations of that resource, that means the amount of water going out and the amount of water going in is equal. So you're not having any overall depletion. You're not having any type of concern with over allocation or, or under utilization of that resource. So you are balancing the inputs with the outputs and the natural regime that it can tolerate. So sustainability is an Oklahoma and cultural value. And I think it's important to understand and note that the tribes here in Oklahoma and abroad have, have always had a close relationship to the land and had a close relationship with, with the aspects and the ability of their social and their, their economy and the environment to work in tandem and in sync rather than against one or another. So in this slide, the three E's, the environment, the economy, and equity, and I'll, I'll actually edit that to social equity. And inside of that is sustainability. And that is really what Choctaw Nation is striving for in all of our water-related endeavors is to ensure that we're balancing the social equity of all stakeholders, tribal and non-tribal. We're trying to balance that, that aspect of non-consumptive utilization for environmental needs and social equity needs. And then we're trying to balance the economy with those other two in mind so we can ensure that the consumptive user and the non-consumptive user and the social aspect are in sync and everyone comes out a winner. Now over here to your left, you also have the three-legged stool, which is often mentioned in many other talks. And I just wanted to show how applicable it is with the three E's in those three binding circles with that um, stool that you see with sustainability on it. If you have too much emphasis on one leg or two legs and not the other, your stool becomes very uncomfortable to sit on and sustainability is not easily achievable. And if you go and take that a step further, for people nowadays, we have to tie what we're doing to, to the applicability of, of the stakeholders in the basin that might not have that close tie to nature the way that they might have in the, in the past. So if we tie to economic growth, you know, you have to have the wet water in your reservoirs. You have to have the legal paper water that you can access that wet water with. And then you have to have the infrastructure to move it to where you need to utilize it at. And that can be for consumptive and non-consumptive utilizations. So why do we care? Why do we care about sustainability and reliability and climate change impacts to those resources inside of our reservation? Well, here pictured is the first Choctaw Senate uh, well back into the day, into the early, I believe, 1900s. So it, it's paramount that we understand that without sustainable practices, we're placing an expiration date on our way of life and the economies that have sprung up for those ways of life to take hold. So these, these gentlemen in this photo, while they were making decisions to ensure that their, their ways of life and their information and their culture was protected, they were also thinking about how they could make sure that the generations that will supersede them will be able to look back and say, well, they, they put us in a great place to continue living the life that they enjoyed. 
So that brings us to this seventh generation principle. That principle is unique unto itself into the tribal nations that when tribal nations make a decision based around natural resources, we think about not only how that benefit our current generation and our current economy and our current uh, socio um, social equi equity, but how will that also benefit the next seven generations? How will that set us up for long-term success? And at the top of this slide, you can see sustainability leads to reliability. Reliability leads to long-term success and a sustainable way of life, a way of utilization for you know, consumptive utilizations and for non-consumptive utilizations. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our hurdles today as well. And I know that uh, everyone else has gotten on there and spoken a little bit about how, you know, climate change and the impacts that we're seeing is often given to stakeholders as, you know, global sea level rise, global temperature change, and it gets so overwhelming and it gets so large that you go, well, that's, that's not a big deal. I don't live by the ocean or that's not a big deal. I, I don't live next to whatever they're talking about or that won't affect me. Distilling that down, distilling that down so your stakeholders locally understand how that's going to directly impact them is paramount to what we do in our initiatives. And it's also paramount, and I think this is one piece that was missing, is when you can tell stakeholders this is going to impact you in X manner, that you also tell them this is also going to affect your pocketbook in X dollars for you, your children, and your children's children. So moving back to my slide here, we also have uh, legislation is probably one of our largest hurdles. Making sure that we can take the science that is being developed by the academic world, distilling that down into a 30 second spiel to give uh, someone who's been elected by the populace who might not even have a science background and tell them how to do things and why they should do it. So the translation of science into policy is a very unique and difficult thing to do, but it is highly important. And I, I implore everyone here today to think about when you do your studies and your science, how can you make it digestible in 30 seconds to someone that makes the decisions that on how we live our lives. That also leads me into one, another point on here. Science for the sake of science is not science at all. And just like uh, the, the previous speaker had mentioned, we're riding this wave of you know, discovery and cutting edge. Sometimes that's not as beneficial as this is how we can make this older way of doing things more applicable and tangible and digestible for the folks that are now out there doing the good work that needs to be done. And we're also fighting stakeholder buy-in and generational entrenchment. And that kind of goes in line with everything else we'd spoken about as, you know, sometimes we have stakeholders that have farmed or ranched in a way that is, has been counterproductive to the overall health of the landscape. And that, translate to that translates to water quality and water quantity for my team. So breaking that entrenchment is difficult, but it is necessary to make sure that we're doing good practices, we're sequestering carbon, we're creating cleaner water, we're having more abundant water in our soils, we're having better soil health. So what does success look like? And I'm almost done, guys, I promise. Um, so it's, it's active collaboration across the board. Choctaw Nation is actively partnering with state and federal agencies. We're active members inside of the South Central Cask. We are active members on all political fronts to ensure that we are for our, our four way, our thinking of, uh, of, of our resources is being exemplified in policy. We need creation of usable and specific science. And when I'm saying that, I, I want a study that says, if you'll try this methodology, it will benefit you X number of times more than the current methodology. We need more science-based legislation and policy to ensure that those, those items that are being outlined in the academic world are being utilized 
and and not so much forced upon, but offered as a tool to the stakeholders in, in the world. Sustainable practice implementation. And of course, we want a sustainable economy, environment, and social equity. And with that, I always like to end with this quote, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Yako Key, and thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you for, for speaking with us. And I'm going to invite Julie to come on stage with me. And Ethan will be hovering behind us on the screen. Not awkward at all to have a guy in hand, but you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Are there questions for our speakers? All right. We got one back there. I'm going. This episode for you, we are working in a very hot spot area, uh, monetary Bay area, where is you know being um, is suffering a lot of loss, personal loss. As a manager, what is your strategy when you talk about sea level rise? When you talk about fragmentation? When you know that what is now is going to become two years, not that fast. How do you approach this in order to give some advice to communities? And how do you integrate that with the power policy? Because you know you say sometimes it's contradictions in time scale. So I'm very interested to hear that because that's the type of discourse that you are in the trenches that we all being in the lab, we, we need to learn to do. I'm going to try to answer it, but not on it, indicate that I'm not answering your question. Um, we do look at what we can expect in maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, the Park Service writ large has a 20 year planning framework. So when, when the park, when our park, seeks resources from the National Park Service and needs to convince the purse holders of the, of the National Park Funds in Denver in DC, then we need to be looking 20 years into the future and bringing the sound science about how our landscape is forecast to change based on our understanding of different potential climate scenarios, different potential major river management scenarios for here. So what would what would happen if the mid-veritarian sediment diversion is implemented? What about that AMA sediment diversion? What if both were implemented? How do those impact freshwater conditions? How do those impact salinity conditions? How do those impact the levels of flooding? Where is the terrestrial landscape versus the aquatic landscape in five years, 10 years, 15? In years, 20 years. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but those that's the kind of forecast information built on sound science scholarship that we as a park can bring to the park service writ large and seek funding for some major restoration projects or help to where our trail system is built, for which part of the trail system we sustain. Um, what of the what of the myriad potential stories that our interpretive and public education staff can tell to the public, which of those they emphasize in the next five years. Am I on target with, with your answer? Or are you looking for more? Can you give us a personal? Oh, personal. Well, are my slides still up? Um, or are they? I think that might on. In the sense of, okay, yeah. I don't know it says. Yeah. Is it not your well, are we going to go with a non-sensory? <laughs> so, okay, okay. Um, I'm going to try to find a couple of photos and see. Okay, great. They're not far away. Um, so I actually met the Baritarian Preserve about 25 years ago when I was in academia and looking at the outcomes of rapid rate of relative sea level rise for uh, bottomland hardwood forest uh, ecosystem processes, in particular productivity, looking below ground productivity. So these were the forest ecosystems I met 25 years ago. Um, I I sort of just kept that work going. I, I kept my 
fingers on the pulse of that time for when I transferred to working for the park as a park steward. Um, but this is the, the first photos were taken sorry, about circa 2000. Second set of photos I took uh, in March of 2018 at some of the lowest, near the lowest um, part of my uh, hydrologic gradient along which I was collecting river pulse samples and uh, using uh, Matt's balance approach to calculate below ground allocation. Anyway, um, the forest changed dramatically. In fact, it basically drowned um, due to increasing hydro period over that time period. So we're at a threshold in the Barrett Area Reserve where increase in a little bit of increase in flooding, or similarly, a little bit of increased salinity, we're a freshwater wellness system, a little bit of increase in salinity will actually transform that the terrestrial wellness system, just similar to how a little bit of increase in tidal period transforms um, the, the whole nature of the of the terrestrial um, ecosystem here. We're going from a forested wetland here to either open water or for, um, a flotant marsh ecosystem, a peat substrate um, freshwater marsh ecosystem in a period that is uh, you know, well within the lifespan of the formerly dominant organisms, the three schools that were living here. Um, so it's a, that's, a, I guess, my personal engagement with the landscape comes from just experiencing this super rapid change um, in the place that I was working with for so long a period of time. Um, and it certainly motivates my trying to understand where, how the system is changing and to then help our, help the decision makers at the park understand the urgency of of making change or of, of the urgency of our adaptive management to um, engage this change and to better understand what the what the park will be conserving as we go forward. Certainly the landscape of the preserve, and I mean by that, you know, the landscape, the waterscape, the place that the park conserves will be very different in um, in another 25 years than it is today. Although we can use some of the scenario tools that we have and our understanding of the external management decisions to better understand what the preserve will be like. Um, and maybe it's not as um, sort of um, watery as I anticipate it might be. We do have a Zoom question. Um, Charles asked, I'm really interested in the cutting edge research idea and how that might be less relevant to place-based managers. Could you both share an example of more relevant science or information to you? In other words, what kind of research can be done that would be most relevant to you? Ethan, why don't you take that first? All right. So the items that would be of more relevance or information to us as you know, resource management managers and, and folks that are trying to influence policy with sound science, I think distilling down what's already out there into something that is digestible, it's easily understood and something that is coherent with, with all the science that's already out there, but in an elevator pitch. We have a lot of moments when we're with people that are making the decisions that influences everybody's life, that um, they make a decision based on information that they hear in a minute or less. Sometimes we get a little bit more time, but the majority of the time it is very quick. And unless they're really well versed in the subject to begin with, they are going in with just the pieces and parts that you can provide them. You know, that's hard to, that's hard to hear, but it, it's the truth in this day and age. So maybe focusing on how the you know, best management practices, maybe prioritizing how those best management practices not only benefit climate change initiatives, but also land management and soil health and the economics related to them. Well, I completely agree with that answer. And I also um, have a, a couple other ideas. Um, and I guess I want to make a little statement saying that, you know, I'm a steward for a public for public land 
And these public lands are fabulous places to do research, and we welcome your cutting edge research, uh, whether it has, whether you view it, whether you intend for it to have any influence on our place based stewardship or not. That we super welcome your cutting edge research. Please come and utilize all our public lands, not just the Veritary Preserve, but all of our public lands for your research. Um, the understanding that you gain there has the potential to inform our stewardship, and we need to figure out ways to translate it better. So we need more people like me who are sort of the, the bridges. We need, we do indeed need to um, be able to listen to each other and as well as talk each other's language. Um, so we need to be able to listen. I need to be able to. I and my our decision makers at the park need to be able to listen to what scientists are perceiving as the most important elements of new understanding. Not really answering the question. Um, I want to hear about carbon cycle uh, in the freshwater delta of wetlands of the Mississippi River. We don't know a whole lot about the carbon storage in our Clozmont Marsh. I want to know how much carbon is there and how much we're losing when we have a high energy storm like Hurricane Ida um, that comes through and because of years of salt building up in the substrate uh, reduces the sheer strength of that Clozmont Marsh and we lose tons of it, like literally tons of peat were lost during a single, you know, high energy event um, last year. <clears throat> that loss in terms of, you, if you think about the value of that carbon storage for, uh, for us, <laughs> for us living here in this place, um, and as, as resource stewards, if we could, if we could talk about the value of the carbon stored in a, in the Del Cape wetlands in the Veritary Reserve, which all the National Historical Park and Preserve, to every visitor who comes to that place um, and help them feel an affinity for that carbon storage there. That's the kind of, these are the kinds of connections we need. So it, it is part of this translation of seeing where your research is exciting to. Um, the people who come visit the place where you do the research, or who might not get to visit it, but who you can bring there to our great online tools um, and all that. Fantastic. We need time. Oh, we've got two over here. Yeah, thanks for this. Uh, it's been really enlightening. Um, so I have a question based on this idea. We've talked about this idea of sound science. Um, and this idea, of course, as scientists, all of us here, we know that science takes time and is, you know, and we get results that are sound and things like that. But I'm wondering about this balance about the idea that, you know, this this emerging idea, sort of the counter side of we are in a, you know, a climate emergency. We are in a situation where if we don't do something within a very short period of time that we may be entering, you know, climates or regimes that may or may not be that we can come back from. So how do you balance this idea behind we make decisions based on sound science that is deliberative, it takes time versus we better do something pretty soon or we're going to have a problem. Ethan, I think we're all looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for, for what you're speaking about, so yes, we need sound science and yes, it does take time, but we've had plenty of time. We have traditional ecological knowledge that we can utilize, which has been vetted over thousands of years from tribal uh, interactions with the natural world that we can utilize that piece, we can look uh, to monetize this as well. And I know everyone thinks that's a, a bad way to look at this, but until people understand the emergency, so when you said emergency, I was like, I hear emergency three times a day when I'm in the office. So it's kind of a moot point. When you tell me um, we have a thousand dollar opportunity or we have a multi-million dollar opportunity my ears perk up and I say, we need to make sure that we capture that funding. We need to make sure we capture something so we can do that project to help these communities. So 
th standing back and using that sound science and looking at how can we place a dollar value on on these these projects as far as they're good to the the human race the environment and the economy so julie was just mentioning how we could potentially sequester uh carbon in wetlands down there and how much peat is being removed during a large storm we need to figure out how much that's costing americans and that how much is that is costing the, the globe for every time we have one of these large extreme weather events yeah we have the damage report and it says this was in the billions of dollars well it's an opportunity cost at that point if we would stop causing an increase in temperature to increase the severity and intensity that's there's a cost savings in that even though it might be more costly up front with a capital expenditure but it's going to pay massive dividends because the cost of those storms is going to come down so maybe rewriting how we look at things would be a good way to go about that and say we have plenty of science and now we're teasing out the the super fine details which is very important don't get me wrong but we are we're in a time now that we've got to act we've got to implement pieces that are going to make a difference pieces that are going to adapt us to the changing climate that's already occurring we have lots of sound science and um super appreciate all the new sound science that you all are developing and will continue to develop um so the challenge is to get that sound science to the decision makers at any level of emergency um it's interesting to hear Ethan say three times a day emergency. Um, I would say the Park Service doesn't do very well with emergency. Uh, we have, you know, super high, super high, super massive organization, um, tons of inertia, lots of friction. We're not who you go to for emergency. Um, when we think about, when I think about how to communicate what's most important to a, the park superintendent, Who's not a scientist? Um, I think I do bring urgency and level of in, level of impact on the whole all of the resources that the park is for, for which the park is a steward. That's where I that's how I formulate you know what becomes then an emergency that I communicate to her. Um, I don't know if that really addresses your question. I think also that uh, I work with the resource management division. The Park Service is super bucket hit. We're in these different divisions. Um, our education division is called interpretation. <clears throat> so our, inter our, our expert interpreters also are trying to, trying to discern what are the emergencies for each place. And then to make that a part of their engagement with the public, the public when the public comes to visit, or when they engage the public online in virtual mode. I'd like to expand on one of those really quick. Go for it, Ethan. So, like you mentioned, your your upper leadership, they're not scientists. Is that correct? Did I hear that correctly? Correct. So what's the quickest way to make somebody who doesn't understand what you're talking about understand it? It's usually put it into dollars. This is going to cost you $100 million and it's going to come out of your budget because this is going to be a massive storm and it's going to affect you directly or your stakeholders. And you are then responsible. That's the easiest and quickest way to respond to an emergency is to show how severe, how severe it's going to be and, and monetize how that severity is going to affect everybody. All right, back there and then Joe. Hello. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for these uh, these interesting discussions. I just wanted to uh, uh, follow up on one of the earlier questions for and you're also talking about it now. How to translate? How hard it can be to translate uh, what academics do mm -hmm. and. and hard science, quote unquote, uh, to uh, the general public. And I think 
maybe one uh, one reason for that is because we we feel we try to understand such complex uh, uh, issues or phenomena that uh, we always have uncertainties. We have, I think scientists in general are very uh, like they try not to make definitive uh, answers or conclusions. They, they try to, but there's always a okay. This is the the main point, but this could also happen, or oh, we're not sure about this, and, and maybe that's what also is is hard to uh, get a, a clear message and, and a single point message. And uh, maybe so. I'm not don't have an answer to that uh, for raising the issue, but maybe uh, as we are, a lot of us here are, are modelers or work with models. I think one of the great thing about models is that um, we can we can play with it uh, much easier than rather to wait 20 years to get data or something like that. So we can, we can play with scenarios, we can play with uh, assumptions and, and oh, what if I do this, what happens? And we saw some examples in the presentations uh, today and yesterday at the, the, the keynote uh, during the dinner. Um, so maybe maybe that's one way as scientists where we can provide more meaningful um, data or, or answers to, to those questions is, is by providing uh, different outcomes, possibilities, or different um, yeah, scenarios. And when you talk about uh, putting a dollar amount on, on, on doing something or not doing something or doing another thing, um, I think it's, uh, I, I'm not sure I, I not that I disagree with it, but I, I, I sadly I think you're right um, that that's what it comes down to, and, and having different scenarios, different uh, ways to approach uh, an issue might be uh, might be how how we need to go. And especially because on the other side, other people talking to to the policymakers, they only talk about money and all the lobbies and. The pressure on the other side for the, is, is using these these dollars as well. So I don't know. If there's no question. It was just. That. <laughs> no, I I definitely agree with you. It, it's sad that we have to break our science into how much is this going to cost you, but I think it's also important to to note. So we're using y'all's predictive models, and so let's say you guys predict X amount of uh, rainfall and X time uh that is super severe and you know there's a probability there's uncertainty around that that could happen there's x amount of probability that that will happen in the next 20 minutes let alone the next 200 years but it comes down to what if you're right as a planner and as the planners that i have hired on as staff we need to be planning for the worst potential scenario because if it does happen, we need to be ready. And if it doesn't, there's no harm, no foul. We've just made our systems that we're utilizing for water infrastructure and watershed planning and et cetera, that much more resilient, that much more sustainable. And we've protected ourselves against something that could be life altering and generationally impactful. <laughs> I have two thoughts to just sort of respond to your comment. And one of them is that um, most likely we can find an intersection between our values and those dollar values. And so it's worth thinking about that, where those intersections are. So when I think about ecological integrity, when I think about the value of the fisheries, the commercial fisheries and the recreational fisheries in the freshwater part of the estuary in which the preserve is a part, uh, like ecological integrity, value of fisheries. Uh, <clears throat> if you think of a uh, dollar value of uh, sustaining visitation to the Veritarian Preserve for the ecotourism um, economy around that area and for the sort of spread larger, the tourism industry in the greater New Orleans area, when we start to think about the intersection of our, either our scientific or intellectual values or our own personal values, with these dollar values, um, you can frequently find ways of communicating, or, oh, yes, communicating effectively where you feel like you're on very solid ground and you're, you can, the person you're speaking with is in the dollar value realm and, and feel your, um, and sense your honesty with the points that you're making because they need to feel 
a decision maker who's not a scientist needs to feel that they're hearing something honest from whomever whoever they're speaking with. So you have to, I, I find those intersections helpful to tap that, um, that they can hear me speak calmly, speak right from what I care about, they can sense that um, care, even if their value system is different. All right, due to time, we have, we'll take the last question and then we will go to lunch. Well, I want to take a different tack, and that is as, as sort of a, as a community ecosystem ecologist, I think one of the greatest challenges for all of us going forward is what systems are already at tipping points that are unrecoverable. And then, when, as Ethan said, we're going to have so much money. The question is, where do we put our efforts? And I think part of the problem is we all look at us in this room. Everyone has systems that we say are sustainable. The problem is they're not. And the, and the difficulty we face is how to adequately allocate the resources to do to keep systems going that are sustainable, that are going to be productive going forward. But we always argue about well, this is and this is the question is no, they're not. I mean, so as you well know, I do a lot with Lubbock and sustainability of, of, of cotton production around Lubbock. Lubbock is not sustainable. Under any climate model, Lubbock is economically is not sustainable. It will not last because agriculture has to move away in the next 50 years. And then what happens to the whole infrastructure that gets built up? We want to keep it going. So what do we have to do? We're going to put more energy and economic cost into that. And we may and we could do something different, right? But the problem is we still have all these other aspects going forward ecologically that are not going to make it. And I and I think that I, I think for me, as we think about how do we approach the general public, how do we how do I talk to cotton producers about what, what you're going to face going forward? They want to be sustainable, they know what's going on. The question is, given the approach that you're you're doing now, row cropping is not is not sustainable. And then what are you going to do? Right? The same thing, the same thing for any of our national parks. You know, I've worked for 25, 28 years at Big Bend. The current ecosystems at Big Bend are not going to last because of already undergoing climate impacts, and they're going to look very different in the next 20 years, irrespective of how much money gets put down there. So the question is, what do we want to do? We know how to logical systems function. So I think the challenge for us is to be honest to the general public, but also to be honest to our lawmakers and say, this is scientifically what's feasible. I mean, we can put all the money we want, and it's like us. We can, we can spend a lot of money keeping us from dying, but that's not going to work. As people, we're going to die anyway. So the question is, where going forward for the next 100 years, knowing what the climate models are going to look like, what is feasible and what isn't, and be honest with ourselves about that. We don't want to have that conversation now. I think we're forced, so as, as place based managers, we're forced to uh, have that conversation and make decisions that effectively are making choices. Um, as part of, as a park that was impacted by one of the major disasters, we tapped into some of this um, hurricane, uh, the disaster funding, disaster supplemental funding that Congress authorized um, for disaster, disaster supplemental 22 uh, <clears throat> will receive, uh, I can't remember how many million dollars for Hurricane Ida impacts the Veritary Reserve. So those funds must be used to address the, actually two things. So the funds must be used to address Hurricane Ida impacts. Right, so you're constrained from the get-go, um, and we we're trying to figure out how to utilize those funds most uh, appropriately, so that we're effective stewards of the dollars as well as of the place. Uh, so that involves rebuilding some trails so that they will be more resilient and both more resilient to anticipated change and more resistant to um, to anticipated change as well. So. Cool. You know, that means probably uh, elevating some of the trails a little bit so they can cope so that the public still can visit this place, whatever it looks like, um, in or whatever, however it operates, however it functions uh, in 20 years. Um, same thing for where they park their vehicle, if they park a vehicle. Are they uh, riding up in a boat or a paddling a canoe? Are they, uh, are they coming in a bus? Are they coming on a bike? You know, we don't know. 
Um, but that is part of what the planning is is geared toward, toward. And for that, you know, we are utilizing scenario based modeling to inform those decisions. And that is, it's been a, it has been a struggle to get the park to invest in that scenario based modeling. And it took a just it took a particular personality. A particular superintendent who wanted to allocate the dollars necessary to engage the expert sophisticated hydrodynamic modelers to produce the product that now they're utilizing to um, to engage this uh, sort of one time uh, unpredictable source of funding that will enable the public to make those tough choices. Ethan, do you want to make last remarks or? Sure. So to answer your question on that, it's going to have to be an overall global cultural change. We can no longer consume and consume and consume and consume and continue to consume and expect there to be no detrimental effects. Just like you spoke about, the cotton industry out in West Texas is unsustainable, but we have raped and pillaged for hundreds of years we're gonna to have to figure out how to have those very difficult conversations in a uh, non-emotional way, but there's so much emotion tied with generational farming, with, with a cultural aspect with the tribe. Those emotions hinder our logical explanations and our ability to reach a common goal of, we're gonna to have to move you from this area because it's no longer sustainable but we can do it over here and we can kind of, we can figure out a process to get that done. But the whole root of the problem is, is we can no longer have a society that is just willing to consume at every beck and call. We, we, we've got to change the way we live our lives as humans, as a planet, we have to start thinking about how does this small step that I'm taking over here in Southeastern Oklahoma affect people all across the globe. And I think that's something that's gonna be a very long and uphill battle, but it's a worth it's worth fighting. I think given what Victor says, I think we have to vote and all of us have to get involved in politics. That's the only way it's gonna change. Politics makes the rules and the rules are not set in favor of science. And y'all are the scientists, we are the scientists. We need to be making the rules.